pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this time, the chair would like to entertain a motion to add an addendum to item D2 for our personnel report. I move that we add make the necessary addendum. Second. Been moved and properly seconded that we would add the personnel report D2. Is there any unreadiness? If not, all those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. This time we will move to our public comments and we have two who are prepared to come forward before us tonight for public comments. And please allow me to share the following. Persons appearing before the school board will not be allowed to campaign for public office for the purposes of promoting their private business ventures and should not use profanity or vulgar language or gestures. Make comments about a public official or an employee that are not related to his or her official duties. Engage in behavior that disrupts the meeting or intimidates others. Or addresses the school board on issues that are not concerned with services, policies, role, and responsibilities of the school board. Individual speakers shall limit their comments to three minutes. A speaker representing a group shall limit his comments or her to five minutes. The representative shall identify the group at the beginning of the presentation, and a group may have no more than one spokesperson. The total time allotted for public comments tonight will be 30 minutes. That in order, we would like to have uh, Taylor Robertson to come representing a group at this time. Welcome. Hello, members of the school board. My name is Taylor Robertson, and I'm an 11th grader at EC Glass High School. I just transferred there this year from out of state. I'm here today along with a group of people supporting me to ask you to purchase 16 extra spots at the Central Virginia Governor School for $75,000 annually. When I was in the 7th and 8th grade at Dunbar, I took seven classes at Glass. Advanced Algebra 2, Advanced Geo Trig, Biology, Spanish 1 and 2, and Advanced Literature one and two. I have always wanted the most difficult education I could get, and that's why I went abroad for my first and second years of high school to Phillips Exeter Academy in New Hampshire, as well as the Island School in the Bahamas. Now I'm back with my family in Lynchburg, and I actually wasn't able to apply to the Governor's School as a junior because I came too late in the application cycle. But I'm a prime, ex prime example of the fact some students are looking for other options outside of Lynchburg City Schools. And when students leave the public schools, so do their families. And the time and or donations and the involvement with extracurricular activities are at the schools. Enrollment in the city with kids leaving to go to schools like Holy Cross or um, James River Day School or VES or boarding schools is going down. And opening up more spots at CVGS may be a way to retain some of these kids. This year I've attended every CVGS interest meeting and I've gone to the open house two weeks ago and had a conversation with Dr. Smith. Before this conversation, I knew my only hope to go was if a current student moved or some other extenuating circumstance happened that opened up a spot. But Dr. Smith informed me that LCS actually has the ability to purchase eight more spots for both the junior and the senior year. And this would allow me the opportunity to be seen as a student worthy of attending. My class rank at Glass is actually number eight, and my math SAT score is 770, which is over 100 points above the average of CVGS at 667. Yet, if no student left and we didn't purchase these spots, myself nor any other deserving student who got, who got denied last year, who wasn't a part of the 21 who got to go, wouldn't be able to attend this year. And no matter how much I want or deserve to go to take biology with their anatomy and physiology class, which is a class not offered at Glass, I wouldn't be able to do it. And that's why I'm asking that you purchase these additional 16 spots. There's other classes and programs at CVGS that ECG and Heritage just don't offer. Physics, internships, research opportunities. So I started talking to people and reached out to people to contact you. I think the students of LCS deserve you putting it on the budget. And I think there is definitely enough interest to fill 29 slots per grade. You designate 50 students in the third through fifth grade who deserve the gifted education then at the GO Center. And those students don't disappear. And additionally, more gifted students arise. 
There is demand for you to add these eight extra spots, and that's what I hope we have shown you by the messages and emails I think you guys have received over the past couple of weeks, as well as the people today, today here supporting me and the people last week at the meeting with Dr. Massey supporting me. The cost to run ECG and Heritage won't go down, but the average expenditure per student in the LCS system was $12,237 in the 2000, 2015 and 2016 school year. The cost to attend CVGS is $4,700. And since students go there for three out of seven periods, it would actually be cheaper for a student to go to CVGS if every student got a waiver with the money that they were able to spend for their education. Obviously, the cost won't go down to run the schools, but I think it is effectively depriving those gifted students of opportunity if we don't purchase these spots. And I understand that the expenditure per student goes to lots of diversified things, like paying for transportation or the education of students with special needs. But I think gifted students have a special need of their own. And that is a education that has rigor, challenge, and fellow students who are interested in putting effort into their education. Every child by name and need to graduation means every child. And there's definitely more than 21 who deserve to go to the Governor's Sixth School and who can succeed and thrive there. I want to go for the challenge, so I'm in an environment with peers like me, and so I can take classes like anatomy and phys. Students in double advanced math have no choice but to go to CVGS or Lynchburg College to continue in their math studies. More and more students are becoming double advanced in math, and that number is only increasing. We need to have space for these students, and we all want to participate in their tech labs and internships and programs that just aren't available anywhere else. If the budget is too tight to approve eight spots per year, then please, I implore you to approve six. And if not six, then four. And if not four, then two. I'd like to remind you of the fact you currently allow two students from outside the city, to, uh, from outside the city of Lynchburg to pay for spots through you. Since you allow this, allow us to at least come up with private funding through scholarships or through ourselves to pay for the slots for the extra, extra students. I can see this working how it does now, with 21 students getting in on your time and money, and more students getting in through the scholarship money, like number 22 and number 23, and then number 24 through 29 getting the option to pay for students, pay for their own slots. I also would like to remind you, you allow the early college students to pay for those slots, so that wouldn't be any different. Yet, I know we would all like for an equitable program in which every student is tre treated equally and is able to go and have access to, the op access to these opportunities equally. So I think it is in all of our interest if it is approved on city council and Lynchburg City Schools mo money. Additionally, this is time sensitive. Other counties have the option to purchase these spots, and if we don't, then they will, and we will never have access to these spots again. So I think the people behind me say, yes, we want them, and so I implore you to please add and approve the proposal to fund these spots for the 2018-2019 school year. Thank you. Th thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Th Thank you, young man, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. We've heard. All right. Mr. Flood, Robert Flood, as an individual. I get excited. I just, I came from the Y, so. Uh, just happened to have this jersey on. Uh, it's five minutes. I got to uh, rescue the youth. So it'll be three, yeah. three minutes as an individual. Five. I got to go. Oh, rescue me. Yeah. Go right ahead. Uh, the topic is old topic, uh, started in 2014. I don't know if y'all remember exactly how this got started. Uh, Ex-offenders, non-violent, uh, volunteering, and it was shut down. Uh, when this happened, uh, there was a guy that uh, had substituted for three years in the school system and uh, had uh, spoke at uh, different schools about different uh, situations at that time. Um, and he asked to uh, volunteer with a friend of his that used to play ball with, AC Glass. And it was basketball at the time, and um, everything went through. But this guy uh, was called down to the superintendent's office, I mean to the uh, human resources office, and he was told that he couldn't uh, volunteer because he had a felon on his record. And it kind of surprised him. By the way, that's me. Uh, that's how they got started in 2014, and we're still talking about it, 2018. Although y'all voted, uh, I think it was five years, to allow people to come in to volunteer if they're nonviolent. I got a letter about 
three or four weeks ago saying that uh, people can take their kids to uh, field trips if they ex funders and there's nonviolent crime. So if they can be allowed to go, which I didn't know at the time, uh, what this insurance situation come out of nowhere. Uh, you know, you, we talking about 2014 and all of a sudden the insurance policy come up saying, well, we're not going to take you on as insurance because of ex-offenders. I don't, I don't understand that. And we've been talking about it since 2014. Seemed like this would have came up right away if, if insurance policy was a big issue. Uh, we still fighting trying to find out why a person got to come home that's been incarcerated for a certain length of time and they are not uh, allowed to go to a school to volunteer because they had a felon on the record. Uh, and one, of the, one other thing that I wanted to ask a while ago, when did it start, where did it start, and what happened to cause it to start to say an ex-offender with a nonviolent crime cannot volunteer in the school system? I never got an answer with that. And, and like I said, we've been talking about it since 2014. And the last thing I you know, uh, heard y'all was talking about the insurance policy. So I haven't heard nothing about that as well. Uh, it's a liability issue. I assume that's why eight people out of nine people voted for five years, which I still against. I think it should be zero because if a person come home from being incarcerated and already done this time, why you don't you know, uh, be against him trying to do something positive for young people. And when we need everybody today, as well as y'all know, I mean, you know, it's crime out there all the time. Some people can talk to people, and we're not the problem today. We are a solution to this problem if you give us a chance. My time, you know, I might be gone, but I'm just saying for other people that's coming along that's younger than me, that have done something and made a mistake, but they came home and they want to volunteer to go to the school system to help them kids and the way these kids are today, something is wrong. One person out of eight people knocked it down, then all of a sudden they come up with an insurance situ situation. I, I don't understand that. I mean, like I said, all the, all, although I was against the five years, and still against the five years. I think it should be zero. If someone come home, why can't they take the time to volunteer to go help somebody out? And the cause of, for them to put an ex funder on this paper saying that they're not allowed, what happened for them to put that on there? Because it wasn't on there. Only thing that I remember being on there was like something dealing with kids, uh, assault on a kid, a sexual uh, mistake or whatever, something happened. I can understand it, and all of us agree to that. No one should be around kids that got something on that record like that. But why one person in this group is trying to stop ex-offenders of nonviolent crimes to volunteer to help these kids out when they need all the help they can get? Can't no one person stop what's going on here, out here with these kids. We have a whole different generation. It ain't like it was when I came through and half of y'all came through. These kids need all the help they can get. I don't care who you are. As long as you're not doing nothing to hurt these kids, why not allow people with ex-offenders ex with nonviolent crimes to help out some kind of way. You know, and I like to compromise with this insurance thing. If that insurance company don't want to deal with, why can't we find another one to deal with? I'm going to step down and I'm gonna go past five minutes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mr. Flood. <laughs> thank both uh, presenters for public comments. We'll now move to uh, item B1, Special Presentation, School Board Appreciation Month. And uh, Dr. Massey, it's all yours. Okay, as you no doubt know, the... Uh, Hello, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, all. Apologies. No problem. Sure. Good right here. As you all know, the month of February marks the annual ob observance of School Board Appreciation Month. The Virginia School Boards Association established this observance in 1989 to encourage public recognition of the roles and responsibilities of school board members and to highlight the importance of uh, public education throughout the Commonwealth. This year's theme, Advancing Opportunities for All, declares local school boards top priority of advocating for public education 
with local, state, and federal leaders on behalf of all students. The Lynchburg City Schools is joining with other school divisions throughout the state to recognize the important contributions school board members make to their uh, com communities. Uh, members of the Lynchburg City School Board receive no financial compensation for their tireless efforts, and this school board is one of very few boards statewide that has student representatives. The nine members of the school board are appointed by Lynchburg City Council. Even though this special event shows an appreciation of school board members, members of the community recognize that their contributions reflect a year-round commitment. They are dedicated individuals who are committed to the continuing success of the city schools and students. Um, let's have a round of applause for our school board. <laughs> Do you, uh, do you mind just giving a brief resume of what all we have up here of uh, uh, schools of... Uh, Can we get in the horseshoe? That's right. <laughs> You've got, I know Darrington's got the handprints right there of course you see Harry in the middle and Bass with their shining stars. Um, and then we Heritage Elementary School has quite a few cards made from some of the kids around the, the tables there. Perrymont's got the baggies that you see. Um, and um, I think Lincoln Elementary School's got a few um, individual cards scattered throughout there. So uh, T.C. Miller made some really neat little um, art, like ornaments with some discs that were really kind of cute. They painted the, the CDs and um, you can hang those up or whatever uh, you want to do with those. Those are kind of neat. And um, So yeah, so there's a bunch of good stuff out there. I, I hope I didn't leave anybody out in what I was going through. I know all the schools contributed, so um, so yeah, but they, they did a good job, and they all brought them from the schools and brought them downtown, and so my, my office was full, and now it's empty, so I'm kind of sad. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your efforts, Cindy, with that, and thanks to the schools for their thoughtfulness in providing these gifts and uh, for our wonderful school board. Um, our chairman has a a, a, a presentation he'd like to make to a very special person that the school board appreciates a whole lot as we all do so I'll ask him to do that at this time. February school board appreciation month um, wouldn't be a board we couldn't function without our board clerk who I think just gets a week out of the month <laughs> <laughs> however we're going to celebrate her as well because the board wouldn't honestly wouldn't function without her. I would be personally, I'd be on medication if it was, <laughs> wasn't for her. So uh, we do have a certificate of appreciation for her, as well as a plaque with a resolution. I'll do the do the plaque first. The Lynchburg City School Board recognizes School Board Clerk Wendy L. Sullivan. Whereas school board clerks in each locality throughout our great commonwealth are appointed by law to fulfill their duties and responsibilities, and whereas school board clerks are responsible for keeping accurate records of the meetings and proceedings of the school board, a record of all receipts and disbursements, and a record of all official acts, and whereas school board clerks perform such other duties and connections with the school business of the city as may be required by the school board and whereas school board clerks maintain frequent contact with the public, including parents, employees, and the media on behalf of the school board and superintendent, and whereas school board clerks in the performance of their duties are often required to work extra hours attending school board meetings, and whereas school board clerks join with school boards to help ensure that students achieve to their highest potential, and whereas school board clerks provide an invaluable service, amen, for school board members and superintendents. The VSBA Board of Directors does hereby recognize the third week of February as School Board Clerk Appreciation Week in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And whereas the Lynchburg City School Board joins the VSBA in recognizing the many and varied contributions of school board clerks. Now, therefore, be it resolved that at its, this meeting on the sixth day of February, the year 2018, the Lynchburg City School Board also recognizes this week of February as School Board Clerk Appreciation Week. Congratulations, Ms. Wendy Sullivan. Thank you very much. I need a motion to approve this resolution. So moved. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye.
and there's a certificate of appreciation as well. As well as, as well as. Yeah, oh, that's heavy. That's heavy. Thank you so much. Yeah, very good. We we do have we do have one final thing. Uh, think it was a little late, but uh, if you could come back up here, we, we do have a little more tangible. Um, Appreciation of acceptance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Enjoy. All right. Okay, so we are on B2. Update on schools denied accreditation. Dr. McLean. Yes. Good evening. Um, as the board is uh, aware, uh, ju and just a reminder, as part of our memorandum of understanding with Virginia Board of Education for our schools that are denied accreditation this year, um, we are to have a, a monthly agenda item um, to give some updates on actions from those schools. Some of the meetings we have schools present uh, tonight, we're just going to uh, verbally just share a few updates to cut across several schools. So four quick updates with you. Um, one or for you. One is a assistance, assistance and training we've been uh, engaging with from the Virginia Department of Education. Last week on, on January 29th and 30th, there were English specialists from the Virginia Department of Ed that visited Eng all the English classes in our middle schools and also examined our curriculum. Um, and the intent of that is for them to be able to provide us recommendations um, for continued work to support uh, continued improvement in our middle school English programs. Um, and we should be having that feedback in the next couple of weeks. We don't have that yet at this point. Um, and we also have Ms. Rabel, who's the Director of Office School Improvement. Uh, she meets with us, the central office team and the schools, uh, three times a year, and she'll be back again on February 15th um, to provide uh, some training and assistance to our schools. Um, second area of update is internal monitoring and feedback that we are engaging in with our schools. In the first two quarters, there's a team from central office as part of our essential actions with the Virginia Department of Ed of our role of a central office where we visited classrooms and provided feedback to administrators um, in implementation of the areas that had been identified for improvement. Um, we identified two or three more specific areas for continued growth and we are following up at this time over the next couple of weeks for a follow-up visit with those um, schools. Um, third area is notification of community. One of the requirements in the memorandum of understanding is that each of the schools that was denied accreditation in their first year of that, they have, they share the corrective action plan with all members of their faculty and they invite parents in for that. I think we had a couple of retakes with snow days, but we eventually ended up having these meetings occur January 24th, 25th, and 26th, offering that in each of the, the three schools that were newly denied. Um, and then lastly, as you're aware, we've had some partnership with Becky DeFore. She provided, continues to provide additional training for our schools um, on uh, how to help teams work in a collaborative fashion to continue to improve. Um, she provided training just this last Friday, um, and we had, gosh, I think 10 schools participate in that, and we'll have additional training on March 16th. So that's just a little bit of updates on what we're doing um, to help not just the denied schools, but also offering some of those supports to additional schools too. Board member questions or comments? Um, Ms. DeFord, does she, does she help, is she coming in regularly, um, like on a monthly basis? I'm just curious. So she has offered professional development sessions. They're not on a set schedule. It's sort of as we see opportunities. So this was the third time she's been in this year. Okay. She also reaches out to principals who are interested that she comes. Um, I believe just uh, in the last couple of days, she was at Lincoln Middle for an example, where they had invited her to come in and uh, her to come in to work at a faculty meeting to provide some training. So she tailors that to individual schools as well as broadly across the division, continuing to do so completely free to the division. Yeah, our thanks to, to have a kind of world-class, not kind of, to have a world-class expert and uh, to help, to help with student achievement and overall success for the, for the school division. Move next to the finance report, Mr. Beckles. Good evening. 
You have before you the financial statements for the six months ended December 31st. Uh, we are halfway through our budget year. As far as revenue is concerned, uh, no major issues I need to bring to your attention. I would just note on your revenue, be beginning with the next month's uh, January's report, I will give you a forecast uh, for the revenue from then on out. At this point, there's no need to be too concerned about our revenue as uh, we stand right now. The expenses, again, no major issues on the expenses. You will note in some of our available um, budget balances, we have a negative, uh, a few of them have negative numbers. Again, at this point, I'm not too uh, worried about that. Um, so there's no need to be concerned, but I just wanted to point out to you that I am aware that they are negative, um, but I anticipate we'll be able to sort that out as we go through the year. But it's a little bit too early to correct them now and then we end up back until we get a full, um, a more accurate forecast, because six months out is still a little bit too far. But just want to bring to your attention that I am aware of them. Um, that's all I have on the far as the financial statements are concerned, the revenue and expenses. As far as the um, enrollment report, you see I attached the enrollment report for um, January. And then the last board meeting, uh, some board members had asked about the in-out report. Um, that is also attached, you can see that for the last two school years. Um, I think it's kind of self-explanatory to see where the students came from, where they went to, where they left our school. Um, so unless you have um, anyone have any questions on the statements, that will be the end of my financial report. Ms. Morrison? Uh, <coughs> I saw um, in our revenue sources that a number of the accounts are at zero percent, like um, regional tuition, at-risk four-year-old. This is kind of standard for this yeah. time of the year? They'll be coming in the second half of the year. Okay. okay. That's why the first half of the year I said to you I don't really do the forecast because you don't see some of the revenues kicking in until after until January, after the second half of the uh, fiscal year. So that's kind of normal. I also want a clarification. Um, we currently fund 32 positions at the governor's school through our budget. And we uh, have 10 more <laughs> that we get because of the rent. 32 plus... 34 and then 10 more because of the the it's 10, 10. 10 but the total slots that are free due to the memorandum that was signed when we occupied the new building right and then we pay for 30 32, 32. 16 junior 16 uh, 32 senior. so that's 42 that's spots that correct. we have at the governor's school yes okay thank you other questions or comments dr brown on the in and out report, can you just help us with that a little bit as far as the number that, looking at the five-year report, <coughs> the number that's 2013, 14, 15, 16, is that, that date, <coughs> as best I can tell, does that represent the fall of 2017? For example, we obviously in 2017-18 school year, where we have 2017 on this column, this is enrollment in the fall in Lynchburg City Schools for 2017? Is that the time point? That is correct. Mm -hmm. uh, it, is, it is a census check that's done mm -hmm. every fall, normally middle of right. September time mm -hmm. frame. Okay. So that's the timing on every year. Okay. And then the, the column on the right, the in and out, is that the total of the two sides, for example, if you look at the, the private school section, it doesn't look like that column on the right totals is the total for the for each school. That column on the right is grabbing a total. So if you take the Amherst County line and you look at the five-year column, that 230, and you look at the Amherst County line in the inside, plus the 170 gives you the 400. Right. But if you go down to the private school section, if you look at Appomattox Christian, it's zero, two, and the total is one? It's not two. That second one is in a five-year column, so there's only one student that transferred in from Appomattox Christian in 2017. Okay. So as you go down that column, uh, should, those, should the total for the year for in and out add up? Should, for example, under Desmond Daw, should the... So the 25, should that be... What is that? 
I don't know where that 25 came yeah, from. Okay, sure. So let's ignore that far right yeah, yeah. column okay. and look at the yearly averages. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that I did in preparation for a few questions is I just ran a quick ratio analysis of the outs versus ins. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this past year was really right in the middle. We've had ratios that have been as low as, as 1.08 mm -hmm. uh, and as high as 1.49. Uh, and this past year, the 2017 count was actually 1.21, which is right in the five-year average. The five-year mm -hmm. average is 1.23. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of fluctuated up and down. Uh, but this is, these are just the students that we know mm -hmm. were enrolled and left mm -hmm. and those that came to us for new enrollments. Mm -hmm. There are many other categories of students that are out there, religious exemptions, homeschool exemptions, and things like mm -hmm. that. And we're, sure. you know, we don't have as good of a data on, on them. Great. Thanks very much. Okay. Dr. Holmes. We'll get that column fixed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, those who prepared it. Could you just tell me the bottom line, since you went through all that to do it, over against the mere presentation, what, what should we take from this? Has anybody prepared to tell us the bottom line of how this become useful for us because for all the reports, that's kind of where I am now. Otherwise, there's no need to give us a report. You want me to? Uh, uh, I guess we both can. Okay. The, the, the thing I would say as far as the board is concerned with enrollment, enrollment, we are funded by enrollment. And I equate it to sales number in the retail business. If your sales number is going down, you want to figure out why is it going down, what can I do to put it back up. So for the board perspective, I would say is you want to make sure that number is either level or increasing. And if it's decreasing, can we explain why is it decreasing and what I'll call acceptable amount. But bear in mind, every student that we lose is revenue, going, um, our revenue goes down our expenses stay the same. So we want to make sure that as much as within our control, because like, we, can't, we can't control someone wanting their child to go to a private uh, school education for whatever reason. I mean, to a certain extent, we can't compete with that. Neither can we compete with um, homeschooling. So there's some reasons that uh, our students go down that we just can't compete with. Then there are others that may be leaving because of reasons we can resolve. Then we need to make sure that we are resolving those. So that's what I would say the takeaway is, what are we doing about the numbers that we can control? Or have more influence over, I should say, not necessarily control. Because you really can't control whether a parent want to take their child out or not. But we surely can, we can reduce the need for them to wanting to do that. That's what I would say the numbers should tell you. Thank you, thank you sir. You the only addition that I have to it is that it was something that somebody on the school board requested. Yeah. So Mr. Beckles felt that it was worth providing it in a venue so that you could all could see it at the same time and all have the opportunity to ask questions. It is an indicator of students as they decide to come to Lynchburg City Schools where they're coming from, which I think is important to us. And for those that choose to leave Lynchburg City Schools where they might be going, um, because as Mr. Beckles said, if somebody is choosing to go to a faith faith-based educational institution, we know we can't offer that. But if they are choosing to go to just a private school that offers normal K-12 education, we can try to figure out what we can do better and compete against how they get our students. All right, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Sorry. It's okay. It's okay. I was going to ask, uh, when people declare that they're going to homeschool, though, they have to send in a notice of intent, correct? I'll defer systems. that one to the board clerk. I think they simply have to request in writing. Mm -hmm. So we should have some record as to, and that's every year though, correct? So we should have some record as to the people, the number of people that are requesting that they're going to be homeschooled. I think Ms. Brown is going to offer up some. Yes. Every year the parents have to submit a letter of intent and also documentation, and they have to be approved for homeschooling yearly. At the end of the year, they have to submit the testing that their students, um, whether their child um, completes um, to be approved for the next year and accepted into that homeschooling uh, program again. And do we ever reach out to them again after they send in their letters or do we just follow up with them? 
Yes, we do follow up. Um, last year we followed up twice throughout the school year and we'll do the same thing this year. So potentially we have a chance to fix a situation that might be why they're homeschooling, if there's a reason, correct? Yes. So we can work on that. And even last year through the public information office, we actually sent out letters from Dr. Braybrand mm -hmm. to all of the homeschool parents, inviting them back to Lynchburg City Schools. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. Ms. Morrison. I think my takeaway on this is that when students leave Lynchburg City Schools to go out of the city or to a private school, we need to have some way of asking why they're leaving so that we can identify areas that if we need to improve or correct misinformation. And at this point, we don't necessarily have that in place, but we need to, uh, if we're going to, to look at this data and say that we need to do something about it, we've got to come up with a way to make this happen. Am I accurate? In I guess, I, could you explain a little bit more about what you're looking to happen? Because when, I, when I walk into the guidance office at E.C. Glass High School and I am withdrawing my, st requesting that records transfer from E.C. Glass to another school, is there a place for me to say I am transferring my student because, or if I walk into any elementary school and I request records be sent, to another county because we're moving. Do we have that information so that we can look at why people are leaving? Okay, we'll have to get back to you because uh, all that happens at the school level right. and I don't know what they might be collecting during that <laughs> interaction. And, I, and my guess is that we're not co co collecting it, but it's something that we should think about doing. Ms. Carter? Mm -hmm. That's similar to like an exit interview. Exactly. Okay. Dr. And, Coleman? And, and thank you all for putting that in place for us. Mr. Polly. Uh, yeah, I don't, um, the rest of the school board, there was an email that we got um, about two weeks ago from the National School Board Association talking about, a, um, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I don't need to talk about um, a, a company called K-12 Insight where they did that study of the top 400 districts in the in the country and essentially to what uh, Mr. Beckles said there are some things that are completely out of our control but the one thing that is that they harped on and put an emphasis on was the customer service aspect um, they asked three questions when families need you can they reach you how long does it take for you to follow up and are your responses accurate complete and courteous and as simplistic as those things are if we take a dive into this infographic and some of the data that they send with it, it does produce results. And I know it's something that uh, I'm not saying is just, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, but they actually offer their, their services to see if there's a way that they, we can help um, get, be proactive about our declining um, student, uh, student population. And so I just think that maybe that's an area that we can look into. I, was in, I, I don't want to go into the, uh, the infographic and the, and the data, but I was impressed when I looked at um, some of the, what they were, the results that they were able to Im implement in other school divisions that show uh, increases in their, um, in their student population. So maybe that's something we can take a look into. Um, I, I, can re I, I meant to reshare it with everyone. I don't know if everyone took a, took a look into it, but it was a very, very good article, um, and it gave a, a very clear snapshot on some of the things that we can do that are in our control because we can't waste time on things that aren't. So um, maybe that's something that we can take a look at and see if there's some areas that we can make some suggestions. And I'm pretty sure we have this information because I know they know exactly where the student is going next. And so maybe it's just pulling it out and getting it from the different schools into one system. Well, it should be one system in one place. Okay, thank you. It brings us to the consent agenda that consists of the school board meeting minutes from the January 9th Student Discipline Committee meeting, January 16th Public Budget Hearing, the January 16th Regular Meeting, January 23rd Student Discipline Committee meeting, and January 25th Special Meeting. It includes personnel report and addendum along with the capital improvement plan for 2019-20 through 20 covering the period from 2019 through 2023 really wasn't that hard okay is there a motion to approve the consent agenda 
Thank you. Is there a second? Any other discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Thank you. Let me move to student representative comments. Mr. Mm -hmm. Shaw, take it away, sir. <coughs> Performing lists miss at uh, on February 16th, 17th, 18th, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Tickets are $12 and for adults and for students and uh, senior citizens, it's $8. And you could also help um, the pioneers compete in the conference in Alabama uh, with the play Second Samuel. You can donate to their fundraiser, which can be found on their Facebook page. And that picture, uh, that's actually Mr. Copeland uh, helping out with the set at, yeah, uh, and we thank him for that. Yeah. For sports, uh, varsity boys basketball, their Seminole district tournament, uh, and their finals will be at EC Glass at 7 p.m. They are ranked fifth in the district. And for varsity girls basketball, um, there, it will be to be announced all of the dates for the uh, tournament and finals, and their record is 19 to four, and they're ranked second in um, the district. And for indoor track, their 3C regional will be at LU, and for wrestling, their 3C regional will be um, at Albemarle High School, I guess. Yeah, and these are. Um, pictures from the senior nights for winter sports that have been uh, occurring for the past few weeks. And I talked to you guys about this uh, last time. Uh, this is called youuplift.com. It's a platform where students can anonymously send positive messages to each other. And these are screened by uh, the creator of that website. And so no chance of negative messages or any of that sort uh, will be possible. And for Heritage High School, he, the creator of the website, he actually gave this, us for, he actually gave this to us for free uh, due to the um, recent climate with students passing away at our school. But for other Lynchburg uh, City schools, uh, there is a price. And if you and you could partner with a business organization to cover the costs, I know like, maybe the Education Foundation could help out or other businesses tied in with Lynchburg City Schools. And this website is really helpful. Um, uh, we introduced it last month, and it's been flooding with positive messages, and it's uh, it's been creating an engaging and a welcoming and accepting environment for all students. So I really encourage you guys to. Um, look into this. And the video uh, for overcoming adversity with diversity. In the beginning of the school year, my friends and I, we created a club uh, and which focuses on eliminating stereotypes associated with different religion, ethnicities, cultures, uh, sexual orientations, and gender. Uh, and it's also there to spread cultural awareness and improve racial relations in our community. And our first video project was recording uh, brave students and teachers at Heritage High School. And I say brave because uh, out of hundreds, they were the ones who wanted to be in the video and reveal stereotypes that people have labeled uh, and imposed on them. And this video, it I re we released this video of uh, two weeks ago during the morning announcements and uh, it reminds us all that our uniqueness is what truly unifies us. One aspect that distinguishes our students from others is our diverse student population. My name is Christian Alexander. Just because I'm white does not mean I'm a racist or a white supremacist. My name is Eric. I am Korean, and I don't eat dogs and cats. In fact, my only dog is Mojito. 
My name is Anak. I'm from El Salvador, and just because I'm Hispanic, that doesn't not mean I'm a criminal. I'm done now. Just because I'm a Pakistani and a Muslim does not mean I have to wear a turban. My name is Anak. I'm an Indian. Now, not a slum dog do they? This India is not a country of slums. I'm Dr. Barbara Hassel, and I teach German here at Heritage High School. And I want to say, just because I'm German, it doesn't mean that I have anything to do with Nazism. So please don't make any jokes around me about Hitler, the Holocaust, or Nazism, because it's really not funny. Hi, I'm Hale Biden, and I'm Puerto Rican. And just because I'm Hispanic doesn't mean I'm high skin. Hi, guys. My name is Megan. And just because I'm African American doesn't mean I can take it. My name is Mohammed, I'm a Muslim, and I'm not a terrorist because Islam is a religion of peace. I'm Kai McMillan, living in an area of my city with the highest poverty rate and lowest academic success will never limit me from achieving greatness. Hello, my name is Eduardo, and just because I'm Mexican doesn't mean I have to get in front I'm Mr. Chung, I'm a teacher at Heritage High School, I teach on Kutu, and uh, just because I'm Asian doesn't mean I know how to do karate. I'm a and I'm Muslim. Just because a few people are extremists doesn't mean that 1.9 billion people are. Hello, my name is Adrián. I'm and I have contended with a stereotype. Despite what people believe, Catholics are Christians. My name is Shazada. I'm a Muslim, and I love my Jewish and Christian friends. Hello, I'm Coach Day. And just because I'm white doesn't mean I get higher pay. My name is Sarah Richards, and just because I am a girl who likes to wear makeup doesn't mean I'm doing it to impress other people. I do it for myself. Hello, my name is Leiva. I'm a Muslim. Just because I have a the job doesn't mean I'm oppressed. I'm not saying just because I'm a lesbian doesn't mean I hate that. I'm Officer Coleman with the Lynchburg Police Department, the school resource officer at Harriet High School. I support each and every student at the school, regardless of race, gender, or nationality. Oh, I had, I still had some stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you quit while you're ahead. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, my oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't trying to cut you off. And right? yeah. uh, in honor of School Board Appreciation Month, I'd like to thank all of you guys for um, being true pioneers and capturing <laughs> the essence of being a pioneer. You guys always put people's needs uh, before your own and that's something that we all admire and cherish in our Lynchburg City Schools. So thank you all so very much for caring about students, teachers, faculty, and uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Coleman. Uh, Mr. Shaw. <coughs> I am just bubbling over with joy, uh, knowing your parents. You have presented to us, as all have, stellar leadership. I remember going over to the school when Jordan's situation was going on, and I saw those signs, and I asked, who was behind all of this? They said, Mr. Shaw. And to see that tape and to see the quality of how it was presented and what it means, you're doing a remarkable job, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. okay. Wow. Move on to uh, school board committee reports. Do we have any reports? Ms. Mason. Um, in anticipation to the governor's school meeting tomorrow, I do have a few other things to report and share with them. Um, early college acceptances are continuing. So um, since the last meeting, we've got additional early college acceptances from Bryn Mawr, Duke, Johns Hopkins, Kent State, Lynchburg College, MIT, the Naval Academy, Randolph College, UVA, Virginia Tech, and Yale. 
Um, the other news is I'd just like to highlight for our community the um, announcement that was made on January 30th of the ANC Wells Memorial Scholarship for STEM fields. Um, this was funded by a donation from Mr. Daniel Bowling Wells, the class of 1980. Nine, who's the current chief financial officer of Netflix. The scholarship provides one male and one female scholarship with $10,000 per year for all four years of their undergraduate education. Uh, the selection criteria will include academic as well as financial need. And the scholarship, I'm excited to share, is endowed sufficiently to continue through decades. Um, Mr. Wells will be returning to Lynchburg on May 6th to personally congratulate and award the first two scholarship winners. And I'd also just like to share that currently we have 24 out of the 66 current seniors are from LCS. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Dr. Coleman. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, just for the benefit of uh, Dr. Massey, I, I would like to request we made a great decision to make the committee reports those committees in which board members are on. And we have several advisory committees. So I'm sure that our agenda meeting once a month now will reflect occasionally some reporting of those advisory committees in terms of recommendations that they're making to us for policy and practice uh, recommendations and or just to get critical updates because as we are shifting from having reports just for report's sake to seeking how we move the needle with appropriate policies, procedures, what have you, I want to make sure that I'm aware of those advisory committees because they're created because they're needed, and you're working with that, I know. But uh, it is important, I think, that this board would be updated and or have an understanding of how to communicate to those advisory committees uh, concerns that we may have. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay, very good. All right. Uh, brings us now to unfinished business. Uh, first is G1, the school operating budget for 2018-19. This is Dr. Thank Massey. You. Thank you. Uh, Anthony and I are, I started to say, waist deep or neck deep in, in the budget. Um, and if we are, we're going to ask you tonight to uh, approve requesting from Lynchburg City Council that they fund our budget uh, uh, as it is, that is uh, at level funding, which is $42,028,498. And also that the city fund the purchase of eight school buses in the amount of $713,000. Anthony and I met uh, several times with our counterparts at the city, uh, Bonnie Sabercheck, our uh, the city manager and uh, Donna Witt, the uh, finance director. Those folks have been very helpful and they're very, very supportive. Um, but city council did request that we uh, cut $1.1 million from our budget. I'm asking the board tonight to request to city council that instead of that $1.1 million cut that we have level funding, I want to point out if we get level funding, uh, we are still $749,194 short from funding the budget, uh, plus w that doesn't include buying a, a single school bus, which we need eight buses. Uh, Mr. Copeland tells me to, uh, for us to stay on schedule to keep safe buses on the road uh, with a replacement cycle of 50 15 years. So it is imperative that we get at least level funding next year if this board is to provide a, an education that we can all be proud of for our uh, students. And um, So I'm going to ask Anthony at this time if he will, he's done a beautiful job uh, boiling all this down to a very simple uh, form for us. Uh, if, if he would uh, it's, it's right behind page 13 in your agenda, uh, the schedule of tier one budget request funding that we're asking uh, for. So, Mr. Beckles, will you do that, please? Do you have that? Yes. 
Oh, you have you have it as a handout. I'm sorry. Sorry about that, Ms. Morgan. That's okay. You you do have it, I think. Mr. Beckler, you want to go over that? Has everybody found that? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The objective here is to try to boil all those pages that we've given you down to a succinct set of numbers. Um, I think we started off by telling you we had $5 million worth of requests, and we had, between the state and uh, budget adjustments on our side, we had $2.5 million of new additional revenue. So with uh, $5 million in requests and only $2.5 million in uh, new money, basically you only could fund half of it. So what we did here was we took out of that $5 million, we took out the school buses, and we took out the um, salary adjustments. So that got us down to the 2.8. Now one item that we did not add when we uh, previously gave you the list in our previous meeting was the $377,000. Um, $377, because at this point, the, there's a potential that Title II, a, uh, Title II Part A grant may be eliminated. If that grant is eliminated, then this 377 that's currently in that grant, um, we'll have to fund that, at least through next year. Now, what we do beyond that may be a different story, but at least for next year. If we don't provide for it, and it happens, we're that much in the hole. If we do provide for it and it doesn't happen, we're 377 to the good, that's a better position to be in. So we decided it would be better to add it in. So that's how we move from the 372 to now 47, um, to, um, 749 is to 372 plus to 377. That's how we end up with a budget shortage of the uh, 749,000. Um, so the only way we can get that is our existing budget, we'll have to cut, let's run off the number, 750000 out of that in order to fund everything that we need here. So just to boil it down to yourself, make it simpler for you to understand why we're up with a $750,000 gap and what we have to do to do that. If our revenues reduce, whatever amount our revenues potentially may be reduced adds on to this seven forty. Uh, 750 number. So I just wanted to keep that in mind as we go through this whole process. And you are requesting this for approval tonight because yes. this, this will be the formal request yes. to the city from, yes, the, from the school system. Ms. Morrison. So in this level funding, we're not, re we're not able if we do this, unless we look at programs that we're offering or things that we're doing now, we will not be able to provide salary increases without cutting what we're already offering. Correct. Correct. Now we, are we are looking at a potential another way of doing it. At this time, I don't have that number, but yes, you are correct. So once we get the, the amount from city council, then that will mean that the school board will need to sit and look at what we are doing and how we can fund what we need to do. That's correct. Now, we said that we had something like $2.1 million in additional funding for uh, students with disabilities to meet their the requirements of their IEPs. Is, am I, that was in Tier 1. I don't know the exact amount. Are you talking about the items that we have on the list on, on that 2.8 that it, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of that in there. Um, I thought, so, so yes. for some reason, I thought it was about 2.1 that, that's mandated that we cover. Correct. Most we have these, no choice. No. That's, that's not an option for and budget. The majority, well, in fact, all of the special ed items that we have on that list are uh, IEP required. We have no choice in providing those. And mandated, I think last year I, I heard we only received about 12% of reimbursement for that money that we are required to spend, if I remember correctly. I don't remember the percentage right off the top of my head. But, but it's it not significant no. to cover mm -hmm. the cost. No. Okay, thank you. Mr. Powell. <clears throat> Mr. Beckles, could you just explain the... Um, I know when we had a chance to meet, you talked about the, the benchmarking and how that put us in a better position this year, that 3%, and how moving forward we won't have that 
essentially adjustment for inflation and how, how, how will that um, how will that picture look for us next year since we don't have that benchmark coming up again for the next several years what does that do for us as a um, as a division rebenchmarking happens every odd year um, and I, I guess the simplest way I would term the rebenchmarking is they adjust the the cost I use for inflationary factor for example this year our cost per pupil went up $337 per student. If it was not for re-benchmarking, we would not have gotten $333 more per student. Next year, I expect it to be flat because it's not a re-benchmarking year. So unless something drastically changes, we're not going to get any additional revenue from the state. I, would just, I don't think um, the city's revenue forecast is going to look any different next year than it is this year because of what I call the structural issues that they're facing with the revenue, um, the revenue base. So from that perspective, I expect our revenue in this next budget year and the following to be flat. Whatever it is now, I expect it to be, that's the same thing it's going to be. What I would be just to keep um, in mind is our expenses keep going up. Mm -hmm. uh, expenses don't stop uh, rising. So it's going to be incumbent upon us um, I mean, to be more prudent with the dollars that we have. That dollar has to stretch as far as we can, but at the end of the day, a dollar still only has 100 cents. It doesn't matter how much you want to buy with it, it still only has 100 cents. So anything that we want, in addition to what we currently have, it's more of a trade-off because there can be no new avenue for new revenue. Thank you. Dr. Senna. Thank you. Uh, can you remind me what's involved with the salary adjustment, what that amount represents? That was to move, I guess, I guess the simplest way I would put it, everybody to the appropriate salary oh, scale. Okay. Right. Uh, it's the simplest term for that. Thank you. This, makes sense. this figure, though, just re represents, I guess, a one-time move, but it does not would we be able to maintain that once? Yes. We, we're not talking about a step. We're just getting everybody to the right scale. Now, what you do after that is a different story. Uh, Mr. I, I, I want to ask Ms. G okay. to come up yeah. and better explain the work that was done to get to that salary amount. What we did was a first step in getting things right. As you know, the salary scales have been frozen for next year will be nine years. So we will have nine repeating steps on the current sale scales that we have. It's really difficult to bring people in like that because they don't understand when I have 10 years experience why I'm making the same as somebody with no years. So the, what we have done is we've taken a, we, we did minimal. We couldn't move people to the step they were on when it was frozen. So we, would, we rebuilt all the salary scales that we currently have with a, a minimal uh, amount of increase between steps. There are bigger increases for some, smaller between some steps. But it gets people to a salary scale that is actually workable. It's not repeating steps, and it does give everybody a little bit of an increase. It would also allow you, you'd have to commit to using the salary scales for every year, but with it not being such a huge amount between the steps, it's not, as, it's not as costly every year, and you could add like a cost of living on top of that to go with it as, as you went along. This is just fixing the problem that's been broken for many years and getting us kind of back on a working step. It's a first step in getting people where they need to be on a salary. Okay. Dr. Coleman. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I'm prepared to, to move for the adoption, further discussion pending, obviously. But, and the reason for it is we've, in previous years, asked for abundance and yet have been able to approve, to prove what we have been able to do with that. So I think that the level funding piece and to get our kids some safe buses that will be up to code. And then we need to make the hard decisions from there around this table on where are we, where do we want to be, and what do we have to do to get there? 
So it's been moved, Dr. Mr. Pauling. The last thing is just, um, just for the people who are watching, um, Dr. I'm sorry, Mr. Beckles, uh, we essentially get about a hundred million for our budget, and we spent that down to about three hundred and thirty thousand. Correct. Are you talking about the fund balance? For yeah, last the, year? Fun, the fund balance for last year. It was four hundred and twenty-six thousand. Excuse me, one hundred and fourteen off. But uh, <laughs> but essentially, I just think it's important to know that we've already went from a hundred million all the way down to four hundred and some odd thousand, which is a lot closer than you would like to be. So uh, that's a haircut. <laughs> um, and I don't have much hair to start with, so the next spot is a haircut. Mm -hmm. It's not worth dying over. No blood, mm -hmm. no blood. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was just for the, the public watching. Thank you. So the motion before the board right now, which has only been the motion that's been made, is we recommend that the Lynchburg City School Board re request level funding from the Lynchburg City Council for the fiscal year 2019 budget in the amount of $42 million $28,498, and that the city fund the purchase of eight school buses in the amount of $713,000. So that, that is the actual motion. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there additional discussion about the motion? If not, ready to vote. All in favor of approving the previously described motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So that brings us to the school calendar for 2018-19, and this is for action also tonight, this evening. Uh, Dr. Massey? Yes, sir. Um, we do have the school calendar uh, for your consideration tonight to, to act upon. After several weeks, if not months, of uh, input from principals, parents, teachers, and other staff, this is uh, what we're submitting to you as our recommendation uh, for 2018-2019 academic year calendar and also the uh, Bass Elementary academic year calendar. Board member questions or comments? Ms. Morrison. Thank you. I, I appreciate the work that mm -hmm. everyone did to get this um, calendar to us. I once again have concern uh, about the calendar and the number of days that students are missing from school. Last year I attended four out of the five listening tours and I, along with other school board members, heard parents express concern about the intercessions. Last year, we worked to get one of the intercessions in February out of the calendar, which meant students had more time in school with teachers with, for direct instruction. I was excited when I saw this calendar and saw that a number of the half days were taken out, but um, a parent sent us an um, email message which made me go back and look at this calendar, and what we basically did was move the time in February to March. And given the snow days in January and February and sometimes into March and the amount of days that students are missing from school due to illnesses, particularly this year with flu, I am concerned about the amount of time that we are losing in January and February into March for reasons beyond our control. We don't have control over snow and illness, but we do have control over designated days that students are out of school. And to have those days in March before when teachers are preparing students for AP exams, SOL tests, and any other kind of tests that they take to me just seems like a waste of student time prior and teacher time. If we wanted to look at the end of the school year when we know uh, there is a lot of time after SOL testing where students and teachers are looking for things to do, um, and shortening the school calendar, to me, that makes more sense. I um, cannot support this calendar because of those days that have been added in March and for those reasons. Okay. Other board member questions or comments? Ms. Snyder. Can someone remind me that I remember talking to uh, a principal, I think it was last year or the year before. Some of the SOL retakes, though, go right up until the very end of May, correct? So those days after that are necessary after uh, Memorial Day. 
so I don't know that tweaking that at all would help. Um, those days are necessary in the calendar. Um, yeah, I've got the same email you did. Um, clearly, administration talked to a lot of people to get this together, and I don't know. I'm torn either way. I mean, I see the professional development days on there, so we need those days as well. Our teachers and our staff need those days. So really, we're talking about two days, give or take, that we're looking at in the March. Students are out for three days, though. The students are out for three days, but it's still going to be one of those days because they still need professional development. So it's two days. So you, say. you know, lay people listen to these debates on, on this <laughs> on this calendar. I, I do want to point out this is 180 school days, regardless of how you cut it. We're still going to school 180 days. It's not like we're cutting days of instruction. Out. But I, I want to oh, go ahead and talk. I want to make sure I'm clear. I'm, I'm, I'm straight what you just said, Dr. Massey. But is the issue days or is it hours? hours? I just want to get it clear in my mind. Well. <laughs> I think the way it goes is there's 180 days that are scheduled instructional and then you count hours if you can't meet those days because of weather and that kind of thing. So the hours only comes in play if it's, you don't have the 180. Right. Right. All right. Right. See, I remember well. I'm trying to just <laughs> keep all this in my head. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, could I ask uh, school board member Morrison, what recommendation do you have? Certainly, uh, some of memory loss needs to be corrected as best we can and some people aren't able to participate in robust uh, summer activities and so maybe some type of enrichment at the end could work but do you have a recommendation? I, I would recommend eliminating the, the two days in March that are designated for vacations um, in March and look at, at time after um, Labor Day, Memorial Day, Memorial Day that we could finish school earlier. I think we're also, I, I, we have a task in terms of using our resources wisely, uh, in terms of using our buildings, uh, uh, our buses, and I think that, that to me also plays into it, that when you close schools, um, is that the best thing to do in, in terms of consistency? And I do know that we have to have professional development day but that could be on a Friday and a long weekend. I'm just, I am, I am being consistent with what I've said in the past and what I heard at listening tours, and that was that they don't like the time off. Other, Ms. Carter? Regarding the BAS calendar, have, are there more intercessions in that calendar or are they, do they remain the same? The same. Like it just looks like a lot more. Mike, you want to speak up on that? Mike's, this is Mike's calendar, by the way. <laughs> 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 you don't like it, Ms. Morrison, right there? Deal with it. Ain't that here anyway. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Massey. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would have to check on. Uh, the comparison to this year's calendar, I, I do believe I'm correct in saying there's a little more days in intercession in this calendar for Bass than it is in the 17-18 calendar. But I would need to verify that and, and provide that to the board. <coughs> Can I, sure. is, there, I is there a minimum requirement or professional development days or can they be as many or as few as as we decide to have um, there's, there's no set days required uh, however I, we certainly agree with Ms. Niger we, we do have that we do need meaningful professional development for our staff okay. And, and that is true. And the, and, and the first word you said would be the most significant, meaningful. Absolutely. Now, my issue would be are they meaningful and the professional development correlating to actual improvement? I tend to want to support uh, uh, School Board Member Morrison's uh, recommendation. 
uh, and I, I just been trying to make sure that I'm looking at, I don't know if I'm looking at it right, eight professional days on one and, yeah, eight. And so. Ms. Morrison. Mr. Ryder, we bank snow days by adding time to the end of, to each school day. Is that how that works? Because we compute in terms of hours, not days. So we're adding time the to standard, our school days. Yeah, the standards of accreditation allow school divisions to require school divisions to go 180 days or 990 hours. Uh, so if you have 180 days to get to the 990 hours, that's a five and a half hour day. We have significantly longer days at all three levels. Uh, for example, seven hours and five minutes at our middle schools, beyond five and a half hours. So with that amount of time, you can, you can get to the 990 hours in less than 180 days. And is there an estimate of how many days that we actually, <coughs> hours or days that we actually build up a bank sure. during the school year? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, the way the law is written, your school divisions are required to make up the first five days that are missed, and then it's, it's every other day thereafter. So with the amount of bank time that we have uh, in the calendars, we can miss 12, 13, 14 days uh, due to inclement weather. We have had, I would remind the board, we have had instances in recent years where we had 180 days with these with the extended day time for for the calendars where we missed little to no days right. and we actually had more day at time than we than we needed we've gone the full days plus the extended time right. so it can work the other way and in, in recent years i would say that has been the case yeah. we've had some snow but um, the milder winters have caused us not to use as much time. You're exactly right. Okay, Ms. Carter. Well, I do appreciate the <coughs> less the um, all of the half days except for two have been deleted. So that was good. I think that's more that's consistent. Good. And, and just to correct right correct myself, we went back and checked. There are the, the number of intercession weeks are the same at Bass for both calendars okay. this year and next year. Thank you. Not to belabor the issue, but um, we think this is a good calendar, and we certainly appreciate any uh, suggestions. It's the, it's the board's prerogative to change the calendar in any way that they they see fit. Um, as this, if if there's no days missed for snow next year, which is not a rare occurrence, it would be, if my figures are right, about 44 days between uh, coming back from. Uh, right after the new year and that break on March the 6th. But if you don't have that break on March the 6th, by the time the uh, April 15th uh, five days holiday comes, it's gonna be 69 days. And I submit that's a long haul for, for students, particularly younger students, uh, kindergarten students that are going all day. That's children. My experience tells me they're worn out when, when, when you have that kind of, not only that, but all students and staff get, get worn out. So it's, um, it does give a break after 44 days, but if you don't do it, uh, which is pretty good stretch itself, but if you, if you don't take that three day break for students, then you've got 69 days. Uh, I submit that's the other side of that thing. Uh, and that's a long, a long stretch. One thing that always bothers me is when we do have a holiday, uh, I'm defending Ms. Morrison's viewpoint on this, I guess, but it, um, the longer the holiday, the more the, the, more the next the, the day that you return to school becomes more like the first day of school. I know that. It's kind of gear up and get started again. Also, it raises the issue of uh, our children who, who aren't fed well at home. Uh, they're, they get two good meals a day at school, and we worry about that. But we do pack uh, their their. We have the backpack program where we provide children uh, food over the holidays. But we've weighed all that, and Ms. Morrison's viewers are not. I don't say they have. They hold no uh, merit, but this is about the best we could we could do from from my viewpoint is, uh, with dealing with our principals and our teachers and 
and our parents, I have met with parents on this, and as we've said many times, if, if the school board brought calendars in to be approved today, there'd probably be nine different ones, and uh, <coughs> it's, it's not, we're never going to find a, a calendar that suits every person, not every parent or every student or every teacher, but this is the best we can do. Uh, at least I submit it is. Okay. Dr. Coleman? If you agree with me, approve it. Yeah. If you don't, just blame Mike. Let's move yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. But no, th 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 thank you, Mike, and everybody. But, but let's, get, let's get back to the... <coughs> thank you, Dr. Massey, for helping me to appreciate uh, that people need a break. And uh, we all look for that. Yet at the same time, the scores are what they are. Where we are is where we are. And when, in fact, can you help me, uh, when, in fact, are these tests that they have to take, what, what, when, it, when is that? So AP testing is set by College Board, and they are typically the first two weeks in May. SOL testing this year is starting on April 30th. And we do have, uh, to Ms. Snyder's points, we do have expedited retakes available now. So we pretty much test up until the last day of school. Um, our term graduates have four attempts, so they can actually retest. They can take it four times if they need to. Um, so there is a lot of retesting that goes on after the, the set window. Meaning additional opportunities for people to. Yes, and that's available now, third grade all the way through high school. Not four attempts, but it's available. I was going to say, I'm, you know, I understand the concerns here. Um, I think it's a pretty good calendar overall. I mean, I'm, I haven't had one calendar <laughs> come before the board where everybody was happy about it. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm good with this one at this point. So that's mine. My I position. So, are there back. additional comments? Yeah, I want to go back to Ms. Morrison. Based on what you're hearing, I mean, you have uh, levels of proficiency and understanding around this. Do you still feel strongly? I do. Well, I'm prepared to make a motion that we would adopt, well, excuse me, make the adjustment of the two uh, vacation days in March and now and place them wherever it would be appropriate in light of the fact that we begin in April, May and have retesting. And I want to go on record for the fact that uh, breaks are necessary, but performance and efficiency and effectiveness is where I am concerned about. And so I want to make that motion. May not get a second, but at least I would have made it. Well, what was presented was a recommendation. There wasn't actually a motion. So, yes, so this is the first motion. Okay, so there's, I, I, I guess, I'm not sure what the motion is. We're taking what days and putting them where? That's the 7th and 8th of March. Take off is the sixth and seventh, and make eight. Oh, okay. Okay. I stand correct. And put them where? And put what where? Just. I mean, you're just getting rid of the professional development days. No. Just. No, they're still there. So how do we determine? I, I understand. How that's going, but how do we? Or how do we determine? Yeah, I think, I think, we, I think we predetermined. predetermined. Okay, that's what I was just making sure before we got to. So just so board members would be aware, but that that change would move the last day of school to the 29th of May, two days after Memorial Day. What? Would not get you out before Memorial Day. So, so it's been moved and seconded to shift a couple of days around. Um, so the kids. 
so they don't give Memorial Day. Okay. And, and, and I have a question on if it's appropriate, Mr. Chair. Is there any other way to do it without the, the adjusting the end of the school? Because if you, I'm, if I'm hearing this right, you're saying we get Memorial Day, then the kids and everybody has to come back to school for two days. Just making sure I'm yeah. clear. Yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm not a, yeah, I'm not a fan of that. Uh, you know, one at a time, Ms. Carter. I'm just not comfortable just saying we're going to stick days somewhere, yeah. and not really knowing the aspects of Think how to do this calendar. Concerned. Really not comfortable so, with that. Well, but, um, okay. So we do have a motion before the board right now. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion related to the motion? Uh, That's what we were doing. So in regards to Ms. Morrison's original thing, you wanted them just in school, though. This would just be shifting those right. days, correct? That's what my understanding of what, what, what the request is to the... So you're, okay. so you're saying take them and... You're recomm you are recommending placing them on May 30th and 31st. That's what we're saying? Hmm. Okay, is there any additional discussion? And I, I, it, Mr. Chair, I just want to say that everybody's wisdom around the table is good, and I am at least very grateful that we are beginning to think and I don't always have to support something just the way it's presented. And it doesn't necessarily mean that one is being naive or not having given some reflection. I'm giving reflection to everything I am suggested. Nor am I saying that the calendar as it was presented is a poor calendar. All I am saying, whatever we're going to do, it needs to start working. Okay. Ms. Uh, Mason? Um, I have, I guess, concerns about if we move it to the 30th and 31st, and I'm sure Ms. Bruce addressed it, but I just want to be clear how this is going to impact SOL retesting and also what impact is it going to be being off Memorial Day, coming back for two days of school and ending the year? The end of the year is usually a wash anyway um, in terms of keeping students attention in my opinion um, so I'm, I'm just concerned about the implications <clears throat> of doing that Ms. Morrison my emphasis uh, is and I know that we benefit from retests but I'm hoping that with more um, directed instruction with students that more students will be able to pass the test without taking numerous retests. I think that there is a way, although Ms. Bruce, you may tell me I'm wrong, um, students at the high schools, many of them do not have to take exams at the end of the school year now, so that time for more retests may be available during that exam week. I would like to see us use as much instructional time with our students as possible. And to me, taking time off after coming in from snow days and illnesses does not make good um, sense in terms of direct instruction. And I, I've said that consistently. Okay, I guess uh, ready to vote on the motion to move a couple of days around. All in favor of the motion to move a couple of days around. Raise your hand. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So is that what, five to four? No. Motion's defeated. So we're back to the uh, original calendar in front of us. Um, is there a motion to approve this calendar? I so move the approval of the, of the calendar as okay. presented. Is there, so moved and seconded. Is there additional discussion about this calendar? Ms. Aye. Snyder. We'll back this calendar um, with maybe the caveat of next year. It would be a little bit helpful to the board if maybe we could just see a just a short, compacted list as to how many people administration talked to. Wow. Was it two principals? Was it twelve principals? How many community members? I don't need names or anything like that, but that might be a little bit helpful to the board. Thank you. Okay. Other questions or comments? 
Okay. All in favor of approving the calendar as presented? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Move now to H1, a new business. This is summer 2018. I guess it should be 2019 summer school program. Wait a minute. Sorry. It's been a long day. 2018 summer school program. And this is for information. To sure. As part of the other calendar. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is for information. Is this going to come for approval? It's typically comes to the board for just for information. Issue. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, it is really a typical process that each time of this year we provide what our plans are for summer school programs. Um, you have similar programs that we offer. A lot of these are tied into state. Uh, supported programs and funding. Um, in selecting sites, uh, we look at where there's different projects going on in the summer to try to avoid conflicts uh, with whether there's construction projects and other things of that nature. Um, so these are presented to the board this evening for information. Would you, I guess, mind giving a quick synopsis of each of them? If sure. Um, so I'll run from top down. The 21st century uh, programs, those are by the individual schools that are recipients of those grants. Um, so those fall in the month of June, right after school. Um, by having them in June, that makes sure those don't compete with the summer division programs that are in July. So from that point down, you're going to see a number of those division summer programs, elementary. Um, students are selected. Uh, based on needing additional supports to be success to be successful uh, with the content, um, so you have elementary remedial there, elementary pedal. Uh, students are identified; those are run co concurrently. You then see the same thing occurring at middle school, um, uh, high school. There's again the remedial program, and then over on the back, you'll see the high school pedal and also SOL Academy, providing opportunities for students who passed the course but did not pass the SOL test. That is a slightly different focus. The, the dates and times are meant to meet state criteria related to reimbursement for different programs. Um, and then lastly, you'll see just a note about online courses. Uh, our intent is to continue what has been offered online the last few years, personal finance and health and PE. Um, and so those um, are offered for those students who want to take the courses typically to create more room in their schedule uh, during the school year. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments? I just have a question about funding. You said that the state, it, their state supported funding, is, does that funding cover all of these programs? It's not all, and we do use some of the, um, the EOS grant extended what has been used to fund intercession as one of its right. components also helps to extend some of these. Mike, remind me which ones are the ones that get reimbursed? The elementary and middle school remedial programs are reimbursed from the state. Uh, we take those funds. We've been able to extend part of the EOS grant that we had when we in implemented intercessions. Uh, intercession was only one facet of that grant. Uh, extension of summer school was another facet of that grant, so we have been able to use EOS money to extend uh, the, the, the remedial program uh, we add to the funds that we get from the state for that. The 21st century programs are funded through the 21st century grants at each of those schools. Uh, the high school program is funded through tuition uh, that, that the students would pay to, to retake those courses. And the online courses are the also online courses are also paid for by the students. So they they cover what about what do they cover? They cover the teachers, the materials, the uh, the sure. equipment, the building. We do not charge the students anything. Any of the costs, any of the associated costs with running the program, such as teachers, teacher assistants, transportation, food services, all of those sorts of things are covered uh, through the funds. Thank you. Okay. The only cost to students is the high school program, and we actually wrote into the EOS grant opportunities to offer scholarships to students where that might uh, be a barrier to them taking that course again in the summertime. Mr. Polly. Um, the online physical education course, um, if you could just um, 
just give me a little bit of how, how does that work? I'm trying to picture uh, gym class <laughs> online, you know, so I'm backdated. So I'm just a little, just, just kind of walk me through how online physical education course works. Because I would not do all the sit ups, I'm telling you right now. <laughs> so I'm just wondering. It's inaccurate, but it's health and PE. Okay. So there's a, there's a health component in that course as well as a PE. There are teachers that are assigned to, to over, oversee and supervise the students that sign up for that course. Uh, they then develop a, a physical activity plan for the summer that is approved by those, uh, by those teachers. They have to then submit logs uh, for, for the work that they've done, have them signed off by, I believe, by their parents and then by the teacher and then the health piece is, is, is there. So it could be varied depending upon okay. what, what each child would want to do as their physical ed part of it. And a follow-up. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Doctor. Just that it's really relatively intensive in the time frame. You have to you have to log and document that you have done. It's almost an average of an hour and a half a day of physical right. activity during that stretch. That's right. Wow. Okay. And the second with the other online class, the personal finance is is that class actually offered in a classroom setting as well? Yes. It okay. Is. During the school year. During the school year. Thank you. <clears throat> Do we have that? Uh, we can put on the. The, just say the elementary pedal students of an amount of students we can take or because it says they're recommended do we I'm sure we have an, yeah. more well, than a handful of students that would yeah. be recommended the, the pedal students are nominated by by the schools mm -hmm. uh, to my knowledge and I don't know if is that correct they're recommended by the schools right and I, I'm not aware <coughs> of we ever denying a student opportunity we if they are recommended we take them pretty much. <laughs> um, we do look at... Uh, <laughs> Where are you, Ethel? Good evening. We, we will look at the recommendations. Um, we do look at reading scores, uh, the SOL scores. Uh, there are various factors that we look at. Um, it, in the past, I cannot think of a time when we denied anyone based on the data that was given us and that we reviewed. There is a recommendation form that they have to complete and students meet the criteria based on scores. Several questions. One is, uh, how are students or parents made aware of the opportunity for support, financial support, to take some of these courses? Because I know of just someone that was really complaining last year they had to pay like a hundred some dollars for summer school for a gym course and it's not as uh, it's not an easy way because they really have to keep a log and um, the teacher does call if it's not done and you really have to work you have to do the, put in the work yeah, it really is a good one mm -hmm. if you think you're gonna get off then you're gonna be surprised but so how are how are parents and students made aware and what is the process is it a difficult process to get a piece of paper or submit your documents to say you need assistance? Or what, what is the cutoff? The EOS grant only supports children in high school that are taking the course that they may have not passed during the course of the school year and they need to retake. The, on, the, the personal finance and the online PE, those are courses that students elect to take and there is no financial assistance available for those students. And, and, the for, and for uh, to, to further that the answer to that, for those students that need to take additional courses to make up a course they have failed, uh, that there is a tuition cost for that program. When we find out that there is a barrier to that, that's when we will kick in and offer to support that that student so that they can take that course. So who 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 lets them know there's a barrier? The parents or the students that the parents they have to the, say? the parents and, and student would would let us know and notify us that there is that 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 cost is a barrier to them. Just through the guidance counselor or through the registration process. Registration. Yes, ma'am. The day of registration. Pardon me. The day of registration. Or yes, ma'am. Okay. So when they're in line, they just say, "I need support," or is there a different? By and large. That can be a barrier too. The other one is um, the utilization of the pedal program. Is that generally filled, or those the programs that we have offered? Because they're wonderful programs. Are they yeah. generally? And then I want to come back to that barrier, just real quick. Without having numbers in front of me, um, 
we could probably benefit from having more students in the programs. Um, we aim to have about 20 students per class uh, so that they can get the instruction that they need during the summer uh, so that they can truly be accelerated. Um, keep in mind that these students are coming from across the division and so the plan to accelerate means that, that teachers spend a day or two initially assessing where they are so that they can develop that plan to accelerate them to the next level because different schools are end up in different places and students come already with different uh, needs so um, we could always use more students uh, to accelerate uh, but we we look at the recommendations we look at the information that comes to us and and send those invitations out and if there's vacant if there are vacancies, then you all send additional invitations out so that everyone will have a chance, an opportunity? Or do you ask for more, like we need, we can, we have 20 more slots or 15 more? What happens, my process is a little bit different from the other summer school programs in that, uh, which minimizes sometimes our turnaround uh, time. So the information, and I'm excited about the discussion about the calendar and summer programs because I can immediately send out information to our schools or send it out earlier this year. Uh, parents would then send me the applications. We work with transportation to get the buses and everything um, situated. And then, unfortunately, sometimes we get applicants who say they're coming and then, then they do not. We, from my office, will reach out to those families and give them a call. And again, it's those families that have been those students and families that have been recommended. So I feel like we do due diligence in reaching back to say, um, "Hey, we really need you to come." The other thing that I would share is um, sometimes mail is an issue. So um, the sooner that decisions are made here with regard to the dates, the sooner we start our process. In the event that mail comes back, we can send it directly to the school and ask for an address change and those kinds of things. It would be great to have a waiting list so you can fill in those vacancies. It would be great, yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh -huh. but thank you. Getting back to the barriers, so you have to, if you're in line in the summer school program, you're about to register, so you have to <coughs> say in front of everyone that you, that you need some assistance. No, ma'am, we wouldn't do that. And I do need to make sure that we're clear that the, the, the amount of funds that are available for scholarships are very limited. Uh, we do not have the, the funding that would support uh, every child that would need to make up a course in summer school so that the family self-identifying that they need assistance uh, then we we would take care of that but we wouldn't do that in an, in an open public way so how would they self-identify I would have to go back and take a look at exactly that process Ms. Carter I don't have that information with me tonight to see exactly how we went about doing that CCLC summer programs and see the, the sites for locations and I see TCM is, is that referring to TC Miller yes sir and uh, when dr. Huskins was with uh, was with us early and talked about all the turnaround and she talked about all her robust keep using that word summer program is this that yes sir okay so anything we're doing in any of our two high schools, three middle schools, 11 elementary schools, etc. This is listed here, so there wouldn't be anything going on in a building that's not included in, in this here? The only thing that I am aware of that would be going on in addition to what you see here is a program that we do in partnership with the YMCA. They do run uh, some reading and math camps for, for students that extend the number of students that we can serve. Uh, they, they're actually targeting through their grant process a different population of students and we've been partnering with them to identify students, particularly from schools that do not have 21st century grants. Uh, we have partnered with them to identify those students. Uh, they have housed that program in Robert S. Payne for the last couple of years and we actually are serving more students through the addition of that program than we would be if we did not partner with them. So it, that's a, that, good, it's uh, a good thing. Thank you. You answered my question 100%. And I don't necessarily need Ethel to come back up as such, but whatever we're doing, we know we don't as Derek, uh, school board member probably mentioned earlier, we can only control what we can control. But it would seem to me that uh, many partnerships 
and ways in which we can extend inclusion to the community around what we are offering or what they can offer, we certainly need to have diverse collaboration to make that happen. Dr. Bowman, one other program that's hosted in our schools, but it's not tied necessarily to education, is the Y runs a summer camp yeah. and has for yes. many decades. Yes, and we host that in one of our elementary schools. That will be Lincoln Elementary School this year. Okay. But that's their normal full day summer camp program that starts after school, ends in June, and goes all the way into probably the first week of August. Got gotcha. you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. One more. Ms. Morrison. I noticed that we're doing a lot in terms of remediation and um, courses, but are we able to offer anything in terms of enrichment? I've been reading a lot uh, from our um, Virginia School Board. Uh, bulletin about coding classes yeah. for getting students into coding, getting students into uh, creating that interest that can lead to careers and I'm just curious if we are able to offer anything like that. Um, I know that uh, there's some classes at the colleges or some of the private schools they're quite expensive and I just didn't know if we could have that opportunity for our students. We have offered at the elementary level particularly enrichment classes in the past. Uh, I don't remember exactly how many years ago it's been we, we, we did away with those because the competition, uh, the, the, the number of available things for children outside of the school system uh, is, continues to grow. In the last couple of years that we, we offered the programs, we ended up having to cut classes because we didn't have enough students to sign up for them. Uh, it's certainly something we can uh, consider going forward, but we, we, we just didn't have the interest uh, because of all the competition out there with sports and sure. all the other things that are going on in the summertime. And some of that was also due to the shortened amount of summer. Uh, so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Move now to superintendent's comments. Dr. Thank Massey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lynchburg City Schools would like to notify our community of our intent to apply for Title IV Part B 21st Century Community Learning Centers grants. These are competitive grant funds designed to provide academic and enrichment programming outside of the regular school day. The grants also support family engagement and literacy programs with families of participating students. Lynchburg City Schools will be submitting applications to continue 21st century programming at Bass Elementary School, Lincoln Elementary School, and Robert S. Payne Elementary School. Community members wishing to review and or comment on these grant proposals may contact Michael K. Rudder, Director of School Improvement and Grants and School Calendars, or Sarah G. Campbell, <laughs> 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 or Sarah G. Campbell, Coordinator of Extended Learning Time. The new date for the Empowerment Academy graduation is tomorrow, February the 7th, 2018, at 6 p.m. in the Marie Waller Lecture Hall at E.C. Glass High School. On March the 8th, the Lynchburg City Schools Education Foundation will be hosting their 12th annual breakfast with the superintendent. This event provides a unique opportunity for local business and community leaders as well as interested citizens to meet with school administrators to learn more about Lynchburg City Schools. After making some introductory remarks, I will turn the program over to a special presentation with Lynchburg City Schools graduate and EC Glass English teacher Aaron Reed. Aaron will be joined by four personable and energetic EC Glass and Heritage High School seniors who will share how their Lynchburg City Schools education has prepared them for success as they continue their education and become engaged citizens and creative employees. And is, has LaTanya Brown still with us? LaTanya, would you mind telling the board uh, and the community about an exciting uh, signing tomorrow for scholarships at uh, Heritage High School? <laughs> at Heritage High School at 1 p.m. Um, there will be a signing for the football players um, to the um, prospective colleges that they will be attending. So they will be announcing the schools that they have been accepted to and receiving scholarships to attend. Anybody we know? 
one of them will be my son. So yes. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't let that go. Right <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. One o'clock. One o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. That's all I Okay. Have. Board member comments. Dr. Brennan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to, in, in, to uh, in an attempt to help uh, publicize and recruit students and families to our kindergartens, I want to thank Dr. Massey for encouraging the administration. I'd like to thank the um, Bedford Hill School and Paul Monroe Elementary and Lincoln Elementary, all of which had open <laughs> houses last week for prospective parents, which was really great. They were well organized, the strings played, the parents were enthusiastic, and I think it was a great display of what we have to offer our city schools. We hope it will bring some families back into the, into the tribe. Thank you. I'd also like to make, just thank also, I was, I was uh, thanks this administration for allowing me to go to the VSBA new, board, new school board conference a couple weeks ago. I missed the one in July, so I got to go. It was very enjoyable. They actually offered me a scholarship for a remedial program to come back this summer, so I'll see whether I need to do that or not. Thank you very much. I just want to uh, say that the representatives, student representatives, are, have just been awesome this year. And it would be great if that video that we saw of Heritage High School could be presented or uh, entered, into the, entered into the Virginia School Board Association contest the video contest because that would I think it would be a winner we'll see it yes and then just to um, just say just how appreciative I am of Wendy and we're both Heritage High School alumna alums and so just happy to just for you to be here and that's Ms. Yeah, I want to echo the comments about Mr. Shaw's video. If we could get that into rotation on our TV channel, too, that would be something, you know. I believe it already is. It already is. That's fantastic. Uh, that was just such a, a moving piece and just important conversation to have in our schools. I um, want to thank Wendy, as always, being a wonderful board clerk. And I want to thank uh, the, the kids at the schools and the staff members for, for providing us year after year with all these thank yous and um, you know, at least myself, I always find one or two and I hang them up somewhere in the house and I look at them all year long just as a reminder of why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I want to thank the, I'm not sure the official word we're using anymore, but the, the people that are the, the first entry points that the kids see when they come into school if they're late or something. What are we officially Currency calling? Attendance clerk. Thank you. I didn't want to get the wrong term. Um, but I had to take my son in today after a dentist appointment and um, the clerk that checked us in looked directly at him and we were a little, it was like 10 o'clock and she looked right at him and said, have you had breakfast? So it's just, you know, that's our first entry point sometimes that the kids see and just to make sure that they're being taken care of each and every day, whether they came in, you know, five minutes late or two hours late. That's an important role that they play. Um, and then one last shout out, I'm sure we'll be getting a board notification about it, but I Love Math Day is happening again at RS Payne, uh, February 16th. And it's just a great day that the whole school comes together and learns all about math. And we have community members go in and they do all kinds of great things and they have contests and um, you know ways to interact with the kids at lunch about math. So I'm sure we'll be seeing something about that, but if you could stop in RS Payne, it's all day long, so February 16th. <coughs> Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Morrison. Um, I do want to thank Wendy. We've worked together for a very long time and um, uh, just appreciate all that you do behind the scenes that no one knows <laughs> the amount of energy and time and effort and thank you for all of us. I would also like to give a shout out to all our school nurses. I have been to two schools <laughs> uh, to pick up students and they have been busy and they, they have been nothing but professional and uh, grateful that they are doing what they do. And thank you to the custodians who are also doing an incredible job of helping clean up whatever's going on in the schools. And hopefully this too will pass, but they, have, uh, they are making our schools safe for our kids. And I really appreciate that. I had on my calendar, Friday was the 90th reunion at uh, Desi, Mm -hmm. elementary that school and that's quite an accomplishment mm -hmm. to have that kind of reunion I think it's this Friday at five o'clock 
for well there's a student um, there's a assembly for the students in the afternoon and then I had for some reason I had on my calendar five o'clock mm -hmm. that there was a, a reception mm -hmm. uh, and I think I have that date right I'm, but um, mm -hmm. that's an exciting thing to have a 90-year reunion uh, in, in our schools and um, thank you all for doing what you're doing it's mm -hmm. great to be on a board that's energized and excited mm -hmm. thank you Mr. Polly um, definitely want to say thank you to Wendy. Um, I know it's Board Appreciation Day, but we all know how much you do for the board. So definitely couldn't let that pa let the opportunity pass without saying thank you for all that you do, keeping us straight, itineraries and everything. Um, so, um, last weekend, I was able to attend at the Lynchburg Library a Black History Month program um, that was phenomenal. It had two great um, traveling singers that came in and they did some impromptu, not impromptu, but they <coughs> just did a, uh, they sung their way throughout black history and it was very, very entertaining. I was literally almost blown away by the performance, but I was a little uh, bothered by the turnout. Um, it seemed to be that we need to find ways to communicate um, things that are going on in the community that our kids could benefit from because I know there were I think I counted seven seven kids in attendance and they all thought that it was a great performance and I was able to speak with the the director after the program and she's very open to trying to make sure that we can kind of coordinate a little bit better because I feel like that would have been something that the kids in Lynchburg would have really and truly enjoyed because it was black history but they were animated and they were singing and they were engaging and it just kind of presented it in a different light so um, maybe there's some ways that we can really just coordinate coordinate our, our, our calendars a little more so we can expose some of the things. As I mentioned last semester, I did the backpack program from the library where if you have a library card, they give you a backpack full of uh, free admittance to any state park with free parking and, and all these other benefits that the library offer. You know, me and my wife, we're very big supporters of the library. We go there a lot. So I just want to publicly make parents aware that the resources that are at the public library that can really benefit all of our kids here in Lynchburg City Schools and hopefully make a intentional <coughs> effort to coordinate those schedules to get those public a little bit more public so we can get better turnout and because um, it's after all it's free these are things that are going on Saturday you might not have anything to do but you can go and enjoy a great program at your local library that can be entertaining and enriching at, and enriching at the same time um, also um, speaking to the announcement, the scholarship, the people who will be receiving scholarships tomorrow at Heritage and, and anywhere in Lynchburg City Schools, um, just I know that there's a, a great and a positive time of year for the people who are receiving scholarships, but this is the time of year when you see children students who maybe not have done the things that they were supposed to have do have done like the ACT or the SAT or making sure that they were eligible for the clearinghouse to receive these scholarships these are all things that you have to have done in a certain time before you can be eligible and I believe EC Glass had a um, some type of event last week where they brought the parents and the football players in and they literally educated everyone on what is required to qualify for a division one or division two scholarship so I really wanted to commend them and I know Heritage does something very similar with their players so to see that the coaches are looking out for their players outside of what they can do on the football field while in the Lynchburg City Schools but thinking about where their um, future could hold and how that the implications of a potential college scholarship so very very happy to see those coaches going <coughs> above and beyond what is necessary um, to get the, um, our, our children to have successful future so um, that's that's all that I have today. Ms. Morrison. I just I left this is really important if you read this morning paper about Jen Armstrong at EC Glass the athletic trainer who was one of 10 uh, Gatorade secondary school athletic trainer award one in 10 in the nation mm -hmm. and to have this caliber of, of professional working in Lynchburg City Schools and working with our athletes um, she started working at EC Glass when I was principal there and she it, it's a full-time job and she does it well and she coordinates with the heritage athletic trainer and we are just very fortunate to have her receive not only have her working with our student athletes but also working in Lynchburg City Schools to provide the kind of care that our athletes need um, just very proud of what she's accomplished Thanks. and thank appreciative okay. Dr. Coleman uh, thank you mr. chair since our last meeting I did have an opportunity to attend Jordan Key's funeral and it was wonderful to see how many former uh, LCS teachers either had notes to share or encouragement. Uh, good sign of support from our school system when 
tragedy occurs. Uh, City Reach Lynchburg took place on February the 1st and the United Way, the Backpack Initiative was presented and it is a host of community organizations, faith-based institutions who are going to be helping our kids in that way. We have a lot to look forward to as we move into the future. Uh, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity had a event this past Saturday where they recognized some of the best of us in Lynchburg. What was most impressive was to see the Fort Hill Community School students who are mentees of that organization being given an opportunity to understand what it means to be a renaissance man and a complete citizen. That is an incredible partnership that needs to continue to be strengthened. The reception for Dr. Edwards was wonderful today. And prior to coming over here for our meeting tonight, I had the privilege of going over to the parent-teacher conference for parents and teachers at Lincoln Elementary School. But it did not take place at Lincoln. It took place at Rivermont Baptist Church so that the parents and persons in the Rivermont area could come there, right there at that location, and shout out to Principal Dearden and Assistant Principal Mrs. Elliott who served as the uh, host for those types of innovative opportunities to go out into our community. I also would like to uh, quickly acknowledge that we are um, engaged in several other kind of opportunities in the community. The Victory Vocational Institute uh, had its launching just a day or so ago and that's going to be a great partnership for us to work with helping kids even after they graduate for the next two years in Region 2000 was present at that. I bring these things up sharing with my colleagues our uh, deep love for Wendy and the great work that you are doing even right now to say let's keep on working together and let's keep supporting our superintendent, acting superintendent, the chairman of our board and let's come together even more as we work to make our school system the very best, that championship school system that you talked about, Mrs. Morrison, and I think it's really important that we do that. And I do want to give a shout out that April the 23rd, the Spring Networking Forum for the Southern Region will take place in Mecklenburg County. And the registration is even going to be less than what we charge, Wendy. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be as effective, but uh, you'll be hearing about that, and I hope we will participate. It's going to be a great program. Okay. Very good. All right. Uh, next school board meeting is Tuesday, March 6th, 5.30 here in the boardroom in this school administration building. And with that, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you.